welcome to this session entitled A Tri-Sector Approach to Sustainable Development. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our web audience again, and if you're live tweeting, this makes me sound really cool and I can say things like that. If you're live tweeting, please use hashtag GPF15. Uh, my name is Glenn Galich. I'm the CEO of the Philanthropy Workshop. Uh, we are a donor education program and network with about 350 members worldwide, many of them here today uh, as part of the Philanthropy Workshop. And uh, we've been here all week in Washington, D.C., uh, looking at the role of philanthropy in influencing foreign policy. And I can tell you the, the atmosphere here is uh, always changing in Washington, D.C. And this year, it's been really interesting to see so much bipartisanship. Uh, you read in the headlines of so much partisan bickering, but we've seen tremendous examples this week of real bipartisanship. In fact, yesterday the Senate passed uh, an, ex an extraordinary bill on human trafficking, which was a bipartisan outcome. So uh, I think we have a, a great environment to be here for. And uh, we're really thankful to come off of Tony Blair's remarks. I think this panel is very appropriate for, to a, a number of things he talked about. Uh, during the plenaries and working group sessions over the past day and a half, we've heard from leaders of multilateral organizations, governments, foundations, global corporations, and social enterprises about the unique and complementary roles they're playing in tackling various global challenges. Now we turn to a conversation about setting a new global framework for sustainable development, one that suggests a tri-sector approach with better coordination and collaboration between a, a wide range of actors. And we have three very distinguished panelists with us today uh, who can discuss um, the post-2015 agenda and the new uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, I'll keep the introduction short since their bios are in the conference program book, starting with Alessandro Carlucci. Uh, he's the former CEO of Natura, a cosmetic company that is recognized as one of the most sustainable companies in the world. Having spoken to Alessandro, you live this. You live sustainability. Oh, we're trying. Yes. We're trying. Uh, the company has been job. carbon neutral since 2007 and has recently become a certified B Corporation. Uh, he has just been, this is the big news, he's just been appointed chairman of the Board of Business for Social Responsibility and will start this new post in June, is moving to New York from Brazil and uh, lots of changes for you. Yeah. Joining me uh, to my immediate left is Amina Mohammed. She's a special advisor to the Secretary General on post-2015 development planning for the United Nations. In the past, she founded and was the CEO of the Center for Development Policy Solutions and has served under several presidents, uh, including uh, as the senior special assistant to the president of Nigeria on the Millennium Development Goals. It's very appropriate for today. Janice um, Wendemero is a trustee at the Safaricom Foundation, which supports sustainable solutions to social challenges in education, health, economic empowerment, conservation, and disaster relief, among other areas. And Safari Foundation has contributed to Kenya's development agenda and the Millennium Development Goals. So before we get started, um, we're very fortunate to have a special address prepared by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, for our benefit. Uh, he could not be here, so he asked Amina to please read those remarks, and he very much wanted you to hear them. So Amina is going to take a minute to stand up and read them for us. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, and this is one of the fun things I get to do. Normally we watch Ban Ki-moon, now I can say his words, and, and hopefully I won't trip over too many of them, but um, he really wanted to be here, and you know, philanthropy and partnerships have been very close to his heart, and what he's used um, as a platform, and successful at that with many initiatives, uh, to drive the completion of the MDGs, and we see that this part is going to be a really major element in the uh, next development goals, the sustainable development goals, so here it goes, a message to the Global Philanthropy Com Forum conference. This is a pivotal year for global cooperation. Three high-level international meetings will chart a new era for sustainable development. The third international conference on financing for development in Addis Ababa in July, the climate change conference of parties in December in Paris, and in September in New York, world leaders will adopt a sustainable development agenda for the next 15 years. 
three intergovernmental processes with one universal goal, putting people and planet at the center, underpinned by human rights and supported by global partnerships and a universal agreement on tackling climate change. Let us be clear, the choices we make will foster a more equitable world or consign hundreds of millions of people to poverty and diminished opportunity. We are deciding what human dignity means in the 21st century. We are deciding how we live in harmony with the environment. The achievements over the past 15 years show what it takes to succeed. Political will at the highest levels, sound policies, and resources to scale up proven methods. But to achieve a breakthrough in implementing this new agenda, we need an unprecedented mobilization of all traditional partners and to embrace new ones. There is a strong call for an inclusive global partnership with mutual accountability and a fair sharing of responsibilities. The United Nations is deepening its conversation with actors who approach the same problems with different solutions. Multi-stakeholder partnerships such as the Every Woman, Every Child, the Sustainable Energy for All, Scaling Up Nutrition, and the Zero Hunger Challenge, and the Global Education First Initiative have proven effective in galvanizing broad-based joint action, defining concrete objectives and clear timetables, as well as serving a mutual accountability framework. I'm heartened by the key role philanthropy has played as a driver of social, economic, and political transformations. Philanthropy has flexible capital and can reach scale and greater impact by collaborating with official development actors and governments. Yet we do need to go beyond viewing philanthropy as a gap filler for government. Philanthropy brings new actors and approaches. It can be innovative and path-breaking. I welcome the strengthened engagement of new and emerging philanthropists from the Global South. As new actors enter the global philanthropic space, we have an opportunity and need to learn about differences in norms and practices, how strategy is formulated, how success is measured, and the drivers of accountability and transparency. If differences are acknowledged and embraced, we can reap the benefits of complementarity. If ignored, they will constrain effective collaboration. We may approach the same problem with different solutions, but there is a convergence of goals. We are here today because we share a common objective, advancing humanity and tackling the systemic challenges that prevent human development. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. I think it's very important uh, to make change that you have very clear goals. And the Millennium Development Goals certainly provided the global community with that opportunity. So it's exciting to think that we'll have a new set of goals, even wider reaching, I would say, um, in the Sustainable Development Goals. But the MDGs were, se were seen in, um, by many and pretty much managed and by government to government, sort of an intergovernmental process. Um, this panel is all about moving around and with government, and that being the tri-sector approach. So starting with you, Alessandro, I thought maybe you could give us some remarks on this question, which is why should business and philanthropy care about the sustainable development goals, especially given that this has been seen and, and managed goals like these as intergovernmental processes? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here learning with you and sharing some of our experience. And um, my first question, my first answer to your question, Glenn, is because uh, it's good for the business. Uh, in a private perspective, my experience is that when you really, first of all, you need to believe that sustainable, sustainability is something good for all the stakeholders. This must be a belief, first of all, in my, uh, my humble opinion. And if you believe, you, you are going to be able to really generate value for everybody, including the shareholders, raising profit, raising EBITDA. So um, sustainability, in my, in my opinion, should not be seen as a way to mitigate risks or to be a good guy or to, to have a, a place on heaven, but to increase your business, to do it better for everybody. And the experience that I had um, leading Natura 
for a long time is that this is true, disengage people because you can offer a purpose to people. Um, this is good again for the business if you really can use sustainability as core of your strategy and, and this can drive innovation. In some way, um, look for the challenges of the social issues, the environmental issues, and try to transform those challenges in something innovative. I have, I have some examples, very simple and practical one. Uh, let me start in giving you an example uh, on a strategic choice that our company did uh, 15 years ago. We, we were at that time one of the biggest companies in the Brazilian market, the cosmetic one, and all the big players were already there, arriving with a lot of investments. And the investment that they did in research was almost our total revenues. So we said, look, how are we are going to compete with those big players in the cosmetic industry, investing more than we sell? And, and then we realized after a lot of research and after talking a lot of with those guys that we, at that time, we were looking for the molecule. So, and to find the new molecule for the skin care or for the hair care, you need to invest a lot of money. And it was funny that one of the vice senior global presidents, these fancy names of one of these big corporations, asked us, do you really need the molecule? And then we started to think, look, maybe we don't need the molecule. Our name is Natura, we are from Brazil. So why don't we forget this need of the molecule and try to research in an area where nobody's doing anything and we can do different. And then we decided to focus our strategy in research in the Brazilian biodiversity uh, ingredients, extracting in a sustainable way. And after 15 years now, the company has a, a good platform, a good technical platform. So it was a huge problem for us to find the molecule and then we find a way to, in a sustainable way, create differentiation and also innovation. So uh, the answer to, to your question is that the approach to a sustainable world is only going to be reached if we work together. Probably you already heard several times this during this conference and I, I suppose that you are going to keep listening, but this is the real truth. I think that there is no silver bullet for our challenges in the future and they are very, um, very big. Uh, we are facing a lot of problems in, in this planet, in our planet. But at the same time, I think that never society um, was so aware about those problems. And this event is uh, a great example of that. And this is a great hope for the future. But to face those challenges, we need to work together. The private sector, um, the, um, the philanthropists, the NGOs, the government, the consumers, everybody needs to work together. So it's not, uh, for me, it's not the, a government responsibility, it's a society responsibility, it's a human being responsibility. And again, going back to, uh, to the beginning, it's good for the business. No, uh, it's not only good for the heart, for the mind, it's good for the pocket, for everybody. Uh, customers can have better products, pay less, and you can raise your profits, if you believe and if you put this in the core of your strategy. Great. Janice, from the foundation perspective? Um, coming from a corporate foundation where we work with communities, sustainability is a must for us because we, we realize that you lose funds through grants that are given to projects and um, as a foundation or as a grant maker you have to ensure that um, the projects that you're investing in are sustainable. Um, I'll give you an example of some of the projects that we have done and they were not sustainable and we lost money. Um, some women group in Kenya had a meeting one afternoon and their goal was to have projects 
that are going to empower them economically. And they decided to rear some chicken, and they wrote proposals looking for money to run their project. And that proposal came to our desk. And um, economic empowerment was one of the key areas that you were looking at as a foundation. And we gave them about uh, 10,000 US dollars to do their project. And they started their project. Um, three weeks down into the project, 30% uh, of the chicks had died. Um, in three months, about 80% had died. And by the time we were going to do an evaluation and talk to the women, there was nothing to show for it. Do you blame the women? We blamed ourselves because we did not ask the right questions. Were these women uh, technically empowered to run such a project? They were not. Most of the people from the, the rural areas have very low education levels. And if us as the foundation or the funders do not have um, we do not ask the important question of sustainability. If we don't take them through training and bring them to levels where they can be able to manage uh, the money that we are giving them, then we are going to be wasting our money. So as a foundation, we realize that we have to step up and not only give money to, to such projects, but have them empowered, uh, incubate them for a duration of a period so that by the time we are giving money, they are able to run a sustainable project. So for us, a foundation, sustainability is a must. There is no option. And I believe for everyone here today, sustainability is key in all the operations. Amina, you're here from the UN. So you guys are going to carry the heavy load on this project. Is there anything you'd like to say answering this question? Yes, I think perhaps to go back to 70 years ago, the United Nations um, came to be just because after the war, nations committed to we needed peace, human rights, and development. 70 years later, we see that we have the opportunity to shape a development agenda that does better than the lessons we learned of what didn't work with the Millennium Development Goals in the last 15 years. Um, and we understand from the challenges and the complexities of the world today that what we need is a universal agenda. Because we are all in the same boat, we are all in the same global village, and what happens to one affects the other inextricably. And we live that every day from climate change to conflict uh, to exclusion, inequality. And, and so that agenda that we frame is not just about governments in an intergovernmental negotiation. It's about governments representing people um, representing what happens um, to our environment and, and saying that, you know, we want to actually put a development agenda at the center of economies that grow, making sure that we have results, as you say, uh, for people and for planet, but it's good for the pocket. Uh, so I think the first reason is that, you know, we can no longer, as the Pope says, continue to be indifferent. We, ha we do have to care. There are implications to it, and we feel it every day. Um, being in the same boat. The second thing is that we know that partnerships work. Partnerships with philanthropy have been some of the most successful, but they've not been at scale. And so today, when we talk about leaving no one behind, it is about bringing everyone's hands to the deck so that we can lift this together. So when you talk about the United Nations, it really is about the partnerships of the people around the world. And philanthropy, for one, um, we had a foundation in my country, Nigeria. We looked at immunization from the point of view of a campaign. So every few months, we tried to deal with polio or with measles. And, and all we got was worse health indices because we really didn't focus on the system. It wasn't so much about the vaccine, it was about how good the vaccine was delivered. 
Um, and for that, it was a foundation that came together with government that now gives us almost zero on polio in our country, and that took a number of years. But you see, the foundation, unlike government, was able to bring the best science forward, was able to be more responsive, was able to leverage political will where it had failed over the decades. So partnership's really important in that. And I think the last but not the least is that what philanthropy brings to the table is that you have a choice, but you choose to put humanity at the center. And I think that goes a long way in the, in the spirit of the, um, and the transparency and the commitment uh, to the global partnership that we need to have this to, to, to continue. So the sustainable development goals, as they'll be gaveled in September, will belong to all of us. And it will be a responsibility that we need to carry uh, because they're a response to peace and security and human rights and, and development. Do you see a um, scenario um, on the horizon where the UN might encourage tri-sector approaches like this as, as opposed to saying we should all be in this together. Uh, you, a good example, you put systems on the table. Um, in strategic philanthropy, you tend to see a lot of very effective philanthropists investing in the least sexy things, systems being probably the least sexy in the world. And they tend to make huge difference, huge leverage, as you mentioned. So can you see a, a scenario where uh, the UN would play a role in coordinating activities amongst businesses um, like Alessandro's former um, employer or uh, foundations like Genesis? Absolutely. I mean, these are already happening. They're just not happening at scale. And I think that for a long time, we've been speaking past each other. So um, with, the, with that in mind, the discussions that have happened over the last year uh, have trying to bring in business, trying to bring in the foundations to a conversation on sustainable development. What will this look like? And I think that we've, we've gained a lot by learning the different language, the different systems that we operate, our expectations. Um, I think more will need to be done on the ground of the countries, because these are different from region to region, from country to country. Uh, but you know, the asset that the UN has in its brand is its core values, is also its convening power that they bring together people who do believe in those shared values. Um, I think we have to make more effort at it. Um, I think also that governments that um, obviously the, the United, own the United Nations, um, need to appreciate, have a better appreciation of what philanthropy does. And I don't think that that is always communicated um, as effectively as it could be. So this has been a real um, journey of um, finding one another's um, assets and trying to bring them together for the common good. Alessandro, as chair of the Business for Social Responsibility, do you see, I, I can see there a, a powerful role for you and for uh, the team to, to put together many businesses that are focused in this, in this space to align with some of the efforts with the Sustainable Development Goals. Do you see how that might play out? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not yet the chairman. I know you're not. Yeah, so you can't commit to anything June. yet, right. Still on vacation, but a <laughs> few, few weeks joking. No, definitely, I think that, uh, well, uh, BSR, as other many organizations that really are not only aligned, but uh, in the sustainability business, um, must be very close to the UN, to uh, philanthropies, to uh, foundations, because again, um, the solution is not going to be found in one place. It's going to be found in different and diverse heads and hearts, if I can say, because some of the problems of the world are going to be solved not only by the mind, but also by the heart. So you, you need people together thinking differently and so uh, definitely BSR is more than committed with uh, the goals that are, that are going to be shared soon and more than this to work in an integrated way you know I'm, and again I'm very happy to be here today because also for my future role it will be a, an opportunity to know um, this group and to guarantee that we can work even closer uh, with uh, BSR. And Janice, as a foundation, foundations like the UN have tremendous convening power. It's one of the, um, I think one of the great tools of philanthropy is that you can pay for people to fly to a certain location and coordinate their efforts. Is this something you see Safaricom doing? Have you done? And would you encourage other foundations to do the same to bring all sectors together? 
Um, what we're doing at uh, Safaricom Foundation is um, starting conversations with the stakeholders in the market. So um, after every three months, we ensure that uh, we bring them together into a room and have conversation on what they're doing, what kind of projects uh, they're engaged in, because we realize that um, partnerships are very key, especially in uh, community-based projects like what we do with the foundation. And um, we've moved away from the corporate, the traditions of corporates for, for PR value and going towards partnerships where we can engage each other and co-fund in some of the projects that we're doing. So by bringing the stakeholders together and having a one-on-one -on -one discussion, then we're able to close into the gaps. We're able to share our learnings so that someone else cannot make the mistakes that we've already done, but learn from our mistakes and even ensure that we are doing better and uh, bigger projects in the community. Great. What I'd like to do is open up the conversation here, uh, maybe a little early, and just get some questions going. Before, as you're thinking of them, and the mics are getting ready to go, I thought I would put Amina on the spot a little bit and see if you might give us just some highlights as to what you think we might see. Um, I've reviewed some of the conference output um, from the Rio Plus 20 and elsewhere about what we might expect to see from the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's a lengthy, lengthy document on the, you know, kind of the the structure around which these goals will come out. Are there any highlights you might see? I mean, I th what I thought was interesting about the MDGs is that they were very clear, very simple. Here's what we're going to do. Will we see the same from the SDGs? Um, I think in the way that we communicate them, perhaps, but the, the reality is that the MDGs were a prescription. And, and for that, it took many, many countries years to come to grips with how they handle these. So they might have looked neat and said the right things, but they, did they unpack into actions that we could take on the ground? And I think many struggled with that. Uh, we see from the crisis that we had with Ebola that it wasn't a question of us getting to grips with health systems. We were just dealing in a very siloed, isolated way, saving lives that was not sustainable. From, from women, from children, and, and we found that with the Ebola crisis, we faced the crisis, and then the whole system itself um, it, it collapsed. And then you had more women dying in childbirth and, and, and young children under five. So I think the, the MDGs, the lesson we've learned is that this process has been one where everyone has said around the table, the countries, the global family, has said this is the response we think we need in three very distinct areas that come together, the economy, the social agenda, and, and of course, the, the environment. Um, so I think we will continue the unfinished business. Gender will be front, front and center, not just as a goal, but as a cross-cutting issue. We will look at health, but we will go beyond the diseases to non-communicable diseases and many issues that now have come up for us um, in countries around the world. Uh, we will look at education going beyond basic education. We still have to deepen that, but we're looking at skill sets for a huge cohort of youth that need to be engaged with jobs. Um, we will look at cities and infrastructure that needs to underpin all of this. Um, and then, of course, climate change, for which I think every day countries wake up to that um, and the implications it has uh, for rolling back a lot of development but uh, losing many lives as well. So I think that the sustainable development goals um, will be what is meaningful. Uh, they will be uh, a pathway that I think we can sustain and we will not reverse. I also think that they will address many of the issues that we have today that we tend to, um, we tend to address with a Band-Aid. So when we look at the symptoms, for instance, of conflict or migration, it's about how we can manage an influx of migrants or the disaster that happen, but not actually look at the root causes of why they're there in the first place mm -hmm. and try to invest in that. And that comes together in this agenda that begins to empower countries so that we can be equal partners in this global village. And I, I think that's really what makes the, the difference for me. I, I look at philanthropy and what it's done just recently to try to alleviate a challenge in the North 
northeast of my country with Boko Haram. They're more responsive. They were able to partner with the community. And you have two of the Chibok girls here in Washington who are going to school. I think that that's absolutely you know, great, and, and, I, and we applaud that. But what we really want is to see how do we invest in the northeast of Nigeria that deals with the lake that when I got in a hovercraft and went across Lake Chad as a child, I thought I was going to the UK. But today, it's a tiny little puddle. That's climate change. That's a loss of livelihoods, fishery, agriculture, trade. We have the desert coming down, you know, 40 kilometers a year. We have exclusion, governance that has collapsed, and institutions. So these are root causes for young people that in the end have no hope, and so they're easy fodder for conflict. And that's what we need to go back to, and this is what really this agenda, I believe, does for us and, and uh, keeps us going um, in terms of you know, really getting the momentum and saying we need a deal in September um, that helps with this and, and that gives a good signal for, for uh, December. Let's see, well, you know, Jane, I think you, you, you're the priority here. You're the, you're the top dog, so. I actually have no idea how to turn it on. I think it's on. So I have a question both for Amina and for you, Glenn. We, in July, there will be this meeting in Addis uh, on how to finance the development agenda. And then, of course, in, December, in, in September, there's the meeting at the UN, and then finally in December, the Paris, the Paris conference. Given the, the emphasis on tri-sectoral approaches, will we be seeing philanthropists at the table, business leaders at the table, bringing solutions to bear in July, and how does one structurally engage that? And then, Glenn, what I'd ask you is, given that you work with over 300 highly strategic and sophisticated philanthropists, is there an opportunity to, to gather um, some of their kind of high-level inputs to share in a structured way that could be useful to that process? Yep. Would you take it? Um, I, I think that uh, what has happened with the Addis conference and the inputs that go into that has been an intergovernmental discussion, but business has been considered a very big part of it under the global partnerships and how that comes in. And since we've had the high-level panel of the Secretary General two years ago, um, where we have you know, big companies like Unilever and Paul Pullman really speaking uh, to the issues of how it's not CSR, it is about changing the business model, We've got a lot to bring to the table, and we will need to bring it. Um, and I think that discussion's gone quite far. It's not there yet, because I think we find it difficult uh, to see how and what do you put as a commitment, because you, can't, you can bring business to the table. You can't make them drink the water. We've got to find the incentives uh, for each of the environments that are required. And I think that's what we're about now, is trying to find those incentives, de-risk them, because there's some very fragile economies, putting in, um, you know, uh, institutions, the rule of law, uh, and, and really dealing with an environment that is more conducive. And, and once that happens, then I think we then can look at some of the commitments we can make for Addis. Still away yet, um, and I think that that will be worked on. Unfortunately, on philanthropy, I think that that's been the most difficult conversation. We all understand and see the value of it, but it's, we haven't been able to bring it into the conversation for Addis yet. Um, and I think that on both sides, there hasn't been the appetite. And this is what we hope um, a meeting like this can begin uh, to, to bring to the fourth, that we, can we provide that space and can we get something to Addis before then? Uh, we, we, we spoke about this two years ago, how do you bring foundations to the table to begin to talk about this? And I think there are anxieties on both sides as to you know, the independence you have, however you be, how responsive that you're able to be um, and effective at the country level. Will that be hindered by being put in a framework that now is intergovernmental? Absolutely not. This is about collaborations and making the most of them. So I think that um, that will happen. These are two aspects that are very new to this. Um, under global partnerships, we have to deepen them. We've seen best practice. But how do we get that in a way that speaks to a universal agenda? Because the universal agenda is taking care of regions and countries that in some cases have not done this. Um, but there is a huge opportunity on education, on women's empowerment, um, on technology, um, you know, so much more effective. We're having a terrible discussion on technology where when you talk to the goals, it's very exciting and you can see how technology plays a role. When you come to the intergovernmental discussion, then we begin to get very complicated about it. And so I think 
having much more of a robust discussion can bring some of these issues in. Now, to answer your question, can I do this by Skype or do we all have to be together? Because <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's the challenge. Um, but I, I take your points. Um, I think uh, bringing together a group of philanthropists is, is challenging on the one hand because they're so wed to uh, the interventions that they're investing in at any given time. Um, and at the same time, there's excitement in getting leverage on global um, initiatives where they can come in and play a significant role or any role. It's a chance to get tremendous value on what you're trying to do to invest. So we'll certainly consider pulling everyone together. Uh, I, I have to say that in prior years, especially during the MDGs, there were times where there was great benefit as a donor network to talk about how donors can play a role in such clear goals and, and how they're different interventions. And, I, and you know, I don't know how difficult something like this would be, but when I look at some of the new innovative models in philanthropy, like collective impact, for example, I wonder if there are ways to scale a model like collective impact, putting the UN in the position of more of a backbone organization so that everyone can, can play in the, in, the, in, the, in the sandbox they're playing in and have that feed into this overall objective. Um, of you know whatever goals come out, so I've got two months to get the meeting together. No problem. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Challenge. A uh, bill here in front. I, I guess I'd like to just build on that. Microphone on the way, Bill. <clears throat> just to build on it a minute because it it sounds, without trying to be too provocative, that there's a a lot of control issues since the convening right now is a government convening. And uh, I guess some years ago, I was putting, I was asked to put together a panel, and in talking to the people who were on the panel, who were government people, who were uh, corporate people, and who were nonprofits, they suggested that if you put people together, that you can agree what the values are that you come to the table with, instead of worrying about what the solutions, because they said, for sure, the first solutions you come up with aren't going to work. So you have to go back to the table saying we have the right values, we haven't got the right solution, and we're going to try again, and we're going to try again. And large foundations, um, which are wonderful, are very different from individual wealthy philanthropists who have very different kinds of views. And, and I think it's, you know, uh, somebody mentioned to me the difference between managing impact uh, as from a measurement point of view and just managing impact. And those are kind of different. And I think if we get caught up on the outcomes that we think we want versus the fact that during the process we're going to learn a lot more working mm -hmm. together, then it, it gets static and it keeps us apart. And so I guess I, I'd ask you, Alessandro, being in a business and having to change a culture is, is very similar, I think, in many ways with your partners, with your suppliers and distributors, to kind of the same problem of how do you lay the the, un, you know, the infrastructure, the foundation, because you don't really know when you embark exactly which way it's going to work. Well, this is probably the, the challenge. How can you, as a part of a system, because, we, again, I think everybody agreed that the challenges that we have ahead are going to be solved only by a group of people, different and different thinking. And the challenge is how can you put these people together producing something good? And, of course, my experience, and I can only talk about my experience, that we did very nice things and we did very bad things also. It's not only succeeding, we have uh, failures during the, 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 the trip. But um, uh, what, I, what we learn is that it takes time, so, and we are not going to solve problems that we produce in the last thousand years in a quarter. So we need some time. So perseverance is very important. I think that flexibility is also important because the, the best is the group, the worst you're here is going to be because you're going to hear and listen things that you probably don't like because it's a different perspective, it's a different point of view. So some kind of flexibility is also important and maybe a humble feeling that uh, you don't have the answers. And this is typically scary people the, when they realize that alone they don't know the answer. And today in the workshop, this morning we were talking about sometimes you need a translator in a meeting. 
And I share with the group that once I had an anthropologist in the meeting because it was not only a matter of understanding what the language you are speaking. I don't understand the way you think about. And maybe this looks like a, a joke, but it's not a joke. So in other words, I think that uh, you need to have flexibility and uh, to really invite people to be really in people that are going to think different from you. Because this is going to create something new, something better. If you put your friend and everybody that knows already what you know, probably nothing new is going to happen. You've had your hand up patiently for a half hour. Thank you. This is a question for Alessandro. Uh, B-Lab started a few years ago a movement using businesses for a force for good. What are your thoughts on that movement? What are the results in Brazil? And uh, what are your thoughts about a B-certification and, uh, you know, Patagonia and then Etsy, the Etsy that just went public? And what are the ramifications of that? Thank you. Oh, several things. Let me, let me try from the, the B-certification. But let me, let me share my thoughts about certification. I think that certification is something good if this is going to help the organization to be better. Personally, I, I don't believe that this is, this, any certification is good to market only because you, you are from this organization or you are, you are you know, behaving like those rules. And in, in the case of the B Corp certification, and even though I left Natura in September last year, I was in, deeply involved with the work. My thought is that we will learn a lot being a, a B Corp because I don't know if we still are, but we, we became the biggest B Corp in the world because the B Corps are very small and small companies can do much, um, how can I say, best things that the B Corps, the big, big, not B Corps. And I thought that becoming a B Corp, we could learn and we could try to be faster and to learn from small organizations. So that's the reason why we, we became a B Corp. So when it makes sense for you and is going to, to make you um, uh, better, I think that makes sense. Uh, otherwise, again, it's a very personal uh, thought. I think that is a waste of time. And nobody is going to buy a lipstick because you are a B Corp. They are going to buy your lipstick if you have good reputation. Of course, if you, if you, if you have good price, if you have a good product, and if you behave like you say. You know, and the B Corp is a, it's a consequence, you know, but internally speaking, it was something good. And uh, without extending too much the answer, I think that this applies for all the other um, movements or uh, uh, organizations that a company can be part of. I think that uh, you should be aware uh, about the choices uh, you made uh, in your organization and choose really the movements or the initiatives that make sense for you. And if you join those things, you, you should be joined fully to really influence and to learn from those initiatives like some of them you mentioned about. I think we have a question right over here. So my question's for a comment and a question for Alessandro. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your participation, and I want to thank you for your comment that businesses actually can improve their bottom lines by doing the right thing, which uh, people seem to often think they're two separate uh, sort of agendas or two separate things, but in fact, I'm a strong believer, and I think a lot of people here are strong believers, that we can improve our bottom lines by doing the right thing for all the reasons you described, so thank you for that. You know, and I think, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of work to do to convince our potential partners whether they be philanthropists or governments or whatever, that in fact we believe that and, and demonstrate that, that we believe that. But convincing, it seems like listening to a lot of the discussion, convincing our partners that indeed that's what a lot of us believe is, is, a, is, a, is a hurdle. So my question is, what are you going to do your first day at BSR? Or maybe after you, after you figure out what you, where your office is and all that kind of stuff. What, what, what's your sort of, what do you want to do when you get there? What's the, what's, what's the gut kind of going in feeling uh, of what you'd like to achieve? Well, first of all, without being a politician, I will say to the BSR team that they are doing a great job. I think BSR is an amazing organization. And um, I, I, what I want to do, and 
uh, we have Marshall here from VSR, we were having lunch together, and we were speaking about that. So I rehearsed a little bit about your question. And I said, look, I want to help um, in some way, and I think that bringing the business perspective um, uh, from sustainability, I think, is going to be very nice for BSR. Because even though BSR is a different um, NGO, I think that the chairman that comes from the business uh, sector can help. Because um, I, I used to, to receive several organizations like BSR asking for support. So in some way, I know what are the questions, how we really, an organization can help a, a company. So I think that I can help in some way in, in this area. Uh, because of my background, I think I can help in Latin America also, because well, my whole, my whole professional life I spend in the region, so I have uh, go good contacts there. And, but, um, and also learn. I will learn a lot, and I'm very happy to do that, because when you stop to learn, you, you die, even if you don't realize. But the learning is a living thing. Uh, but most important, going back to something that I said repeatedly, I think that uh, if I can keep helping BSR to work in a cooperative way with the, the members, the associated, uh, and also with the philanthropists that are very good friends from BSR and the government, we can do better. So I think that, and personally, I like to, to really put different people around the table if we, we have a common goal. We don't need to think the same, but we need to have a common goal. If we have a common goal, we are going to produce nice things, even if it takes time, if we disagree, but it's going to, to happen something good. Yes, 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 anthropologists need it every time, you know? Janice, is there a coordinating approach to corporate foundations in the African region? And if so, are goals like your, your reference in, the, in your bio is being a foundation that focused on the MDGs. So were there other corporate foundations doing, doing the same, and do you see that coming forward? Um, we have uh, organizations uh, for foundations. We have the East African grant makers. We have uh, the AGN that brings uh, together foundations in Africa. And um, we're able to discuss matters, uh, grant making, uh, best practices um, in, the, in the area of operation, and bring together even individual uh, individuals who are doing projects in the community and hold their hands and show them what to do. Because uh, most of the time we focus on corporates, we focus on NGOs, and we forget that there are other people who are doing a good job in the community who would need to learn from us. So yes, we have organizations that we encourage people to have membership and come and learn in our meetings and find out how to do it. We had a question way out there. Yep. John Harvey, uh, today with Alliance Magazine. The stakes are high for billions of grassroots community members around the world, and I don't think that we've necessarily talked to the, about them sort of being at the table. What would you see the role of philanthropy in ensuring that they are at the table? What is the role of business? Um, what, what are we doing to make sure that, that those voices are being heard at these high-level convenings? Amina, would you like to start? Um, well, first, I think uh, with business, that's been a very big subject because a lot of the discussions and concerns of member states has been the practice of business in communities and to the exclusion of communities and, in fact, sometimes to the damage of communities and environment. And I think we've seen from best practice of responsible business that this discussion um, has taken root in trying to find how do we, um, through the business models, change that practice? How do we actually put the checks and balances in? What are we going to do with the review mechanism of this? and make sure that um, we, we can do that at the country level. 
uh, emphasis in communities, emphasis in country. Um, that, that certainly, I think, has, uh, has been something that we've been doing quite, quite a bit. I think that um, another discussion that doesn't seem to have taken hold is this whole new birth of um, philanthropy in the global south. And while we, we speak to the global north, uh, where philanthropy is established and where we see success and scale, um, that hasn't happened as much at the country level. And I think as we go forward, it is, it is really uh, growing very fast. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more successful and rooting and becoming much closer to the community because it is there. But as I look at this title, Disruptors and Decision Makers, uh, I think for me in this conversation, it is the women that are going to make the difference. Uh, women in terms of disrupting the status quo because they understand across a number of, of multi-sectoral, multi-plicities um, of, of situations would bring better solutions to that. But also because in decision making, you will find that they will bring a community together, uh, bring families together, bring businesses together. So I was quite pleased as I looked across the room that this is, even the United Nations, I don't see this division of more women in this room um, in philanthropy and <laughs> take this best practice back um, uh, for decision making. Um, I often joke about it, but when we really think about the situation, um, climate change, and we talk about that the decisions that have taken us to where we are today um, are all man-made, I would keep saying, let's underscore the man and have more women in the room so that we can make the changes that are needed for that. Would anyone else like to comment? Alessandro, perhaps, to that last one? Yes, sure, sure. <laughs> no, I, I could not agree more with Amina. And... <laughs> and <laughs> And I, I would like to, to say again what I said some minutes ago, that the, the, the world needs people taking decisions, not only by, with their mind, but their heart. And even though the men, we have hearts, you know, guys, we typically forget to use it. And women, they have minds, of course, but they have a better way to balance, you know, and to put um, a humanity sense in their decisions. And I think that we, we are missing this balance in, in the world as a whole. I'm, I'm not talking only about sustainability, I'm talking about the challenge that we have ahead. So um, I agree with Amina that uh, you must have a balance between the female and the male. And most of times you don't have. And, and sometimes you have women acting like a man, more minded than hearted. So also this is something that means must be a balance, you know? So I, I really believe that we need to have more women in the decision and... I want to take a question on that side of the room, if we can get a mic over there. Um, but before, as you're working the mic over, I want to make sure we've answered the question, which was, will there be mechanisms in place for the grassroots to be heard? Yes. Uh, there, there already are mechanisms in place. We have major stakeholders and we listened to people when they said major stakeholders of big um, NGOs, uh, international NGOs, uh, uh, that come, coalitions that come to the table don't represent the small people. And then we again brought into the mechanism of the negotiations uh, NGOs and CSOs and community groups for that. I think what is more important is to get out of, and this is what we hope to do, is that when we come to implementation, what is the role then right. of communities and civil society in the decision making, the planning, the rollout of a sustainable development agenda when it comes? Will they be at the table when this, um, in, in the past, because this is a, a big um, concern of many people, they look at business and government as an unholy alliance. Can we change that and make sure that that alliance is about communities, people, business, um, and government delivering? Um, on, on the sustainable development goals. There's a very big push for that, and, and, and I think that we will continue to, to drive that from uh, the country level um, in the reporting. That's another thing that's come up, is that the indicators that we produce to measure whether we are actually doing what we say we want to do in a political agenda that's not legally binding, um, how do we work out the role of civil society uh, to report on that? We've got about 30 seconds. So, Fran, pressure's on. Uh, just a quick question to Amina. Uh, what role do you see for open data standards in monitoring uh, the progress of the SDGs? In particular, I'm thinking of the International Aid Transparency Initiative, which both philanthropists and government donors can publish to. 
Mina, you have 15 seconds. 15 seconds to say something about it. One of the big discussions has been about the data revolution, which is already going on, and the United Nations is a bit behind the curve. But it is happening, and it is about two things. Really investing in traditional data at the country level so that they have the capacity to take control of that. And I don't mean control, but at least take ownership of it. And then what is the collaboration with big data? So that big data is not running it, but is collaborating to get us much better feedback in real time and complement the kind of disaggregated baseline data that we're going to need for this agenda. That begins to start, that begins to fuel the question of transparency and how this then brings credibility to the reporting and indicators that we put in place. So before we thank the panelists, I just want to make sure everyone knows that uh, tomorrow morning there'll be a breakfast session on strengthening philanthropy's contributions to the sustainable development goals. It'll be at 7.30 a.m. in the Roosevelt Room. Uh, and now I'd ask that you remain seated for a brief musical interlude that'll show, that should help you prepare for your transition from being listeners to active participants in the working group sessions. So thank you to the panelists. And I want to thank Alessandro because at my next meeting, we will have an anthropologist there. Okay. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.